before we get into talking about line integrals of scalar functions, we're going to have to just review the concept of a parameterization and some simple examples. So the basic idea I'm trying to communicate here is that a parameterization is a way to describe a geometric object. Here I've gone through the steps to find a parameterization of the line uh, connecting these points. Let's just check really fast I did the work correctly. The basic concept here is final minus initial times t plus initial. So negative 3 minus 2 is negative 5. Here's the negative 5s. And uh, then plus the initial point. The initial point here is 2. So you can see here in the x coordinates, there's where the 2 goes. Sometimes we've been viewing these as vector equations, and sometimes we've been viewing them as parametric equations. This is a very common example as well. I feel like students that are familiar with polar coordinates, it's pretty clear where I got this from. Is this the only choice? If I want to make one revolution of the circle, this isn't the only thing that I could do. Actually, here I could just let t go up to pi, but then it wouldn't make it all the way around, so I could just change these t's to 2t. And in effect, what I've done here is made the particle move around the circle twice as fast, um, but go for half the amount of time. So I've still ended up with one revolution. I'm getting sick of writing the word parameterization. Here we are again, finding another parameterization. I just want to remind you that it's always easy to turn a regular equation into a parametric equation by making this kind of trivial substitution. I'm going to let x equal t. And then for the dependent variable, you can just choose whatever the like original formula here was, um, and boom, you've done it. Congratulations. Um, and then all I did was, you know, if if x is supposed to go from zero to two and x is t, then t is supposed to go from zero to two. Also, a lot of these choices of letters are just standard things that we make, but there's nothing really special about y being the dependent variable and x being the independent variable. I could just as well choose z or any other letter that I want. basically chop something up into a bunch of little pieces and then calculate some amount multiplied by the size of the piece that it corresponds to and then add them all up. And I'm going to call that a weighted sum. Students in physics class are probably familiar with this idea. There's a lot of problems with a thin wire in it and I'm going to suppose this wire has variable density, delta. Then each of these little pieces of a wire is essentially a little cylinder, and so here I've calculated the volume of that cylinder. And then I'm sure you're pretty familiar with the process from here out. Essentially the mass of a small piece is just going to be the density of that piece multiplied by some measure of the size of that piece. Sometimes I like to imagine that the radius of the wire is 1 over pi, the square root of pi meters. That way, when you plugged it in for this r right here, it would cancel. There's always going to be some constant that's going to depend on the shape of the cross section of your wire. So pi and r are both constants in this case. When you first see this, I could understand how this doesn't really feel different than what we did last time we calculated a, an integral. Um, but I just want to point out that, that this is different. What's different here is this ds that goes on the end. So in Calc 1, we were always imagining that the object that was changing was on the x-axis as, as x moved down the x-axis. 
And here we're imagining a particle that's moving along this line. So that's why we call it a line integral because it's not just moving down the x-axis, it's moving along some path that we've defined using a parametric equation. Each time the particle takes a step forwards along this path, we're not just multiplying by the change in x, we're multiplying by the change in arc length. So there's a special case of this that doesn't really fit with our applications to physics and engineering, but sometimes helps students with their conceptual understanding. Instead of thinking of delta as being the density of a point on the path, you can also think of delta as being the height of a, of a sort of wobbly thin sheet. Um, and the height here is variable. Then one of these little slices, uh, the area of one of those little slices would be approximately F dS. So if you added all of those up, um, you get approximately the area of the sheet. I just want to point out that this is something that is very, very different from the double integral with respect to uh, the area differential. Um, you really got to pay attention to what comes at the end of these integrals because they mean entirely different things. All right, enough talk. Let's do one. So here we're going to calculate the total mass of a wire where the wire is a straight line that connects these points. I'm super lazy. This is just the line segment from the first example that I did over here. So I just copy and pasted the answers over here. Step two, let's find the arc length differential. As t varies between zero and one, we have a particle that will move from the point two, one, negative three to the point negative three, zero, five. For each little tiny step dt that time changes, the particle will travel the square root of 30 dt meters along its path. What we're calculating is the integral of delta ds. So here's the delta term and here's the ds term. This doesn't really help me though because I've set up an integral here with respect to t and z depends on t. But a parameterization is a description of a geometric object. So since I know that I'm on the curve, I can use these description of all of the z coordinates here for the density z. And that's it. I got four square root of 30. If the units of delta were kilograms per cubic meter, then these units would be kilograms.